Welcome to Sydney team number 92. <laughs> so tonight we're really lucky to have Kate, uh, Dr. Kate Quinn. How fresh is the doctorate? Uh, middle of last year. There you go, Ooh. freshly minted. So <laughs> I'm going to be talking about the very topical immersion, emotion and the future of design. So that's what we're in for tonight. Just want to acknowledge that we're on Gadigal country and I pay my respects to elders past, present and future. A huge thanks to ThoughtWorks. Michelle's here. Not ThoughtWorks, Think <laughs> Face. Think <laughs> Face, yeah. Another two, two word up. <laughs> thanks to ThoughtWorks as well because they've been a sponsor for a long time. Thanks, Kate. There you are. Maybe we're still on. But tonight, we're Think, think Place's place. Yes. There we go. Anything you want to tell us about Think Place, Michelle? Awesome. So thanks, Think Place. <laughs> we'll fix it in the edit. <laughs> and for those who I don't know, I'm Ben. Uh, so I'm a co-founder of SidDT, and I'm also the founder of uh, D Dynamic 4. Getting the names aren't coming tonight. So, <laughs> which I started over 20 years ago, so you'd think I'd know the name by now. Um, so we're a social enterprise in B Corp. And we spend our time coaching leaders to solve problems that matter. So that mostly takes the shape of a whole bunch of coaching and designing and delivering leadership programs, design innovation, all learning through doing to help leaders design, build, and launch their ideas that customers actually love, that they make money. <laughs> make money as well, they've got to make money. Uh, do great things for people and our planet, and all while increasing well-being while we're doing it. So. Bringing all of those things together, that's the focus of what we do at Dynamic Form. The crew that brings this to you every month, and at the moment, which I'll share in a moment, is a lot more than every month, we've got three in February, um, is this crew here. So, Kate's in the front, Zoe's here, Kylie's here, and Lucas will be back in action soon. And he's leading the April one, so hopefully he's back in action. We've got the first week of March. Hmm? We've got an event the first week of March. We do. I've got them all coming up. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, yeah, but hopefully we'll have Lucas back in action. We've got one next week and the week up. So, another huge thanks to our members. So, uh, what was it? End of October, November last year, we passed the 9,000 member mark. And so, thank you all. Thanks for being part of the community. As at this morning, we're at uh, 9,144. So we're closing in on that 10,000 member mark. Give and me your friends. So bring your friends, <laughs> spread the word. <laughs> and, and it's a vanity metric, but June is our um, ninth no birthday. No pressure. No, birth, no pressure, but no. June is our ninth birthday, and that'd be an awesome time to line up 10,000 members. And we might even make it our 100 meetup, so we'll see what happens. <laughs> Buzz the cops, yeah. It's a pyramid scheme now. How many friends can you bring? <laughs> so, a quick highlight, sneak peek if you haven't been looking at LinkedIn, uh, sorry, at uh, Meetup. Really not doing good with names tonight. <laughs> so, I'm looking forward to sitting down in a moment. So, not enough, apparently. So, we've got a lot. So, we've got um, next week, Thursday next week, which will also be here. Uh, we've got Michael Wilkins from Strategizer. He's over from Denmark, and he's going to be talking about business models, designing resilient business models in a VUCA world. So that's on Thursday next week. Same place, same time. Definitely think place. Good. Um, and then the Tuesday after that, 
we've got a design mega meetup by its old name, mm. and it will be the unveiling of a new thing called Design Connection. Well, <laughs> So it'll be the, the usual suspects of Sydney T, EUX and CCX coming together. So the crew that's been doing um, the design mega meetups over the last few years, we're now coming together as this name of design connection. So I'd say make sure you go and get your ticket for the 27th of Feb, but it sold out weeks ago. So join the wait list and you might, and if you didn't get the notification, then check your meetup notifications because I've sent multiple about it and check my LinkedIn posts. Ooh, ooh, so, <laughs> advance notice. <laughs> but um, maybe, maybe the ABC in high demand, and it's going to be at the ABC, so they're hosting, oh. and it's going to be an interesting one. I could do a March one. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, Kylie's so getting So, for March. the March one, it is on International Women's Day Eve. It's going to be in line with the UN theme, Counter in um, Invest in Women and Accelerate Progress, and we're going to have three speakers coming from a strong design and financial services background talking about how we can use design to really close the gaps that we have economically at the moment, improve financial literacy and also improve better employment pathways for everyone. So that will be the much event. And tomorrow we finally get the green light for everyone so the email should get sent out. So that's the first one in March to look forward to which is awesome. And then at the end of March or towards the end of March we've got another one which will be a collab between Design Outlook and a special focus on the uh, Design Outlook Design Leadership Sydney. <laughs> uh, and then we've got Sarah Stokes, who's here. She's going to be one of the, um, I'm not dubbing you in for that one yet, but <laughs> on at actual uh, Design Leadership, uh, Sarah's going to be one of the people who are one of the hosts and sharing some stuff on that day. Woo! Woo! So that's Yay! another one I look forward to. Lucas is organising the April one, and then we've got in, what have we got, 9th of May, our normal May rhythm, back to the second Thursday of the month, which is our normal rhythm. Um, we've got Martin Tomich and Steve Beatty doing part of their book launch tour for Designing Tomorrow. And when's the CCX? Is it next month? Same month, May. May as well. They're getting a, a couple of tests that week. Well the, book, <laughs> well, the book actually comes out, is available in Australia uh, in May, so these are the uh, little first, preamble, first, yeah. and so jump on a ticket and they'll be giving away 20 copies of the book, so you'll get it before it's officially launched in Australia, if you are one of the lucky 20. Ah, so that, that's a glimpse of some of the stuff coming up. They're giving you 20 books to give away, are they? <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> I just want the same deal. <laughs> Um, no, by the way, as is, as is like, you know, two thirds sold out already. There you go. So, there you oh. go. Get amongst it. So you've got two, two bites of it. So plenty of stuff coming up. Lots of ways to get involved in the community. Um, this is the immediate one, Thursday next week. Uh, still a few tickets left for that. That's not not too many. Wilkins, it's the way he spells it. So. <laughs> <laughs> but he's Danish, so Danish they spell it differently. <laughs> <laughs> so Michael Wilkins is uh, from Strategizer and is from Denmark, so he's coming over from Denmark um, and he is one of the co-authors of my favourite business book ever, uh, which is a business model generation. So he was actually one of the co-authors of that with Alex Ostervolder and, and the rest of that sort of Strategizer crew. So that's going to be a fun one. And then if you're really into some Michael Wilkins action, then there's a very small number of tickets left for there's going to be a deep dive dinner on the Friday night. Uh, so if you're keen, then... Can you be more specific about the deep dive dinner? There'll be a dinner and we'll be diving deep. <laughs> um, so I think, <laughs> I think it's only about a dozen tickets. Uh, so it's a small group. And so it's basically a round table to be able to dig into and dive into some deep topics and sort of gets Michael's experience. So he's a, um, as part of the strategizer, he's sort of an executive advisor and does a lot of stuff globally. So he'll definitely have some interesting global perspectives. Zoe. Where's the dinner? I believe yeah, it's at Hart's Pub in the Rocks. <laughs> <laughs> and it costs you a hundred bucks for pizza. No. Where is it? Hart's Pub. So hit that QR code. It is a hundred dollars plus booking fee. 
um, and that one's being organised by uh, Food Agility and Enactus. Um, so Stephen and Selena. So one last QR code for you. <laughs> and we thought QR codes would never be good for anything and then never go away. Uh, so do design leadership. Stokes is going to be a key part of that. Uh, 11th of April, and then if you use the promo code SIDDT, you'll get a 10% discount. So check that out. The format for that one, it's specifically focused more at design leaders, and it's not a typical conference style. It's actually a series of roundtables. So uh, Stokesy, um, we've got Frankie and Arietta are the three who will sort of talk about three topics. And then there's a whole bunch of tables, with each with their own facilitator, and that's a series of roundtables to then sort of discuss. So it's a very interactive sort of half-day format, followed well, starting with lunch and closing with drinks. So it's a fun day. <laughs> so if you're going to get a ticket, Sid DT as a promo code to get you 10%. So that's enough about what's coming up. Let's immerse in the now. <laughs> so. <laughs> so very lucky to have Kate coming and having a chat. Obviously, it's very topical, and but there's many pieces to it. So I'm looking forward to hearing what you've got to share. Thank you Thanks, so Kate. Much. You're good. I think I am. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, I just wanted to start by thanking the organisers of um, Sydney Design Thinking for having me here today. Uh, and I also wanted to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Aura Nation, uh, the traditional custodians of the land on which we are meeting, and pay my respects to Elders past, present and future. Uh, so, immersion, emotion <coughs> and the future of design, that is what I'm talking about today. Um, it's going to take about 40 minutes and then we can have some time for questions at the end, but if anyone has anything like burning that they want to jump in, feel free. So just a little bit of background on me. So my sort of career spans three areas, which has been digital strategy, um, content and emerging tech research. Um, so I started my career working in um, digital creative advertising agencies, mostly offshore in New York and London. I progressed to a senior role where I was overseeing um, strategy and content creation, mostly from a writing <coughs> point of view. Um, and we was working on then emerging platforms, which is mostly in the social media space at the time. And my interests really span digital media, interactive media, and then storytelling. So I got a bit of an itch on the storytelling side and I decided to do a master's in creative writing. And then when I came back to Australia, I didn't really know what I was gonna do. So I just decided, okay, just continue with this academic thing. Um, so I ended up doing a PhD looking at XR technologies, a bit of AI and Web3. And my focus was on emo um, emotion, embodiment, and um, storytelling. And now my interest is really around the question of how can we enhance consumer engagement, audience engagement, user engagement through creativity, innovation, and new technologies. So today I'm going to be looking at immersion, so where we are and where we've come from. Emotion, and I'll take you guys through the framework that I developed for my PhD, uh, which was about how we can unlock the deeper emotional possibilities of immersive environments. And then I'll look at uh, the future of digital design through three trends that I think are kind of, um, yeah, emerging. And then lastly, I just want to look at ethics and digital design and uh, in particular a methodology that I came across during my research which I found really useful <coughs> and interesting. So, immersion. What is it and why is this phenomenon so important today? So, I'm going to start with where we are. Um, just get Apple Vision Pro out of the way. <laughs> I know that's why everybody's here. Um, so, a lot of people are saying we've now entered the age of spatial computing and so the Apple Vision Pro just launched a couple of weeks ago. I don't know if, like you guys, my LinkedIn feed is just constant 
reviews and demos of it there's been like a lot of buzz around it um, so I think about 200,000 uh, headsets have been sold in the US uh, and it's expected to be available internationally around the middle of the year so the Apple Vision Pro um, has a bunch of amazing features um, of particular relevancy to today's discussion um, and what I'm really excited about is it's got these dual OLED displays that have a resolution that rivals like a 4K TV um, and it also has this digital crown um, where you can basically adjust the level of immersion that a user experiences when they're in mixed reality not if you're in full immersion because the point of that is obviously full immersion um, but so it's basically a latest headset to join a bunch of other mixed reality headsets uh, which have this pass through capability which basically you have digital elements that appear to be overlaid or integrated with your physical surrounds so this is actually just a stock image because I'm kind of paranoid about using copyrighted imagery um, but this gives an idea of it but this is not the Apple Vision Pro um, but that's kind of yet to give you an idea of how it, it feels to uh, have that kind of interface um, so the launch applications are across retail entertainment communications productivity um, so there's you know for example you can uh, be in a like cinematic experience where you have like you're watching a film but you are also transported uh, to outer space and, and you're on the moon so it's kind of like riv rivaling the, um, the cinematic experience of going to the theatre uh, there's you know also retail brands that have launched uh, with so for example yoga brand in the wellness space where the user is transported to an environment that is like relaxing for them um, and then they also get to um, kind of explore different clothing and actually see the difference in textures between different clothing, which um, that's kind of amazing that you can now do that in immersive technologies because the resolution has been a big thing. So one of the users of the technology said that it was the first time that he could get into a flow state actually using it. Um, and I think that's a really good indicator of the fact that, yeah, Apple is really, you know, um, as they're good at doing, capitalising on this moment in time where the technology is really at a place where it be, can become mainstream. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's pretty much that. And then, um, yeah, I think, you know, in the larger ecosystem too, Meta Reality Labs posted one billion in profit. They still have huge losses, but it's showing that there really is this kind of upward trajectory. It's happened a lot slower than like a lot of people in the ecosystem would have liked, but it certainly is um, getting to that mainstream um, inflection point. And, um, you know, it's, yeah, we're gonna see the age of spatial computing. And as I will take you guys through now, it's also really this shift to the age of experiential media. So, while immersion can seem like a modern technologized phenomenon, uh, we can really trace this concept and experience back to something like um, the Paleolithic art practices um, that you can see uh, with um, depictions of like hunting successes or um, rituals. They don't really know exactly what it was depicting, but they have a few guesses around that. Um, so, you know, visitors to these caves, and I think these ones are closed now, but there's some other ones that are still open. Visitors to these caves get transported back in time um, and really get immersed in a feeling of what it was like, um, you know, and what this meant to, to these kind of ancestors. Um, so as we trace the trajectory of communications media from something like this to books and film, we can see that essentially um, they're using representational strategies to um, through and through the human capacity to suspend disbelief to actually engage with the content as if it were real um, so uh, the the psychologist Victor Nell um, said that when you look at immersion um, in reading it's kind of like the experience of getting lost or absorption and entrancement and meanwhile um, the film critic Andre Bazin um, said that film kind of aims to um, give the illusion of reality um, for the spectator and through that then creates this experience of immersion. 
So as we move to digital media, um, we've seen this trajectory of the kind of um, increasing merger between the human body and the technology. Um, and so a VR researcher, Frank Bjorka, um, called this the sort of phenomenon of um, progressive embodiment. Um, and there was a great example that I loved from this video game researcher, Brendan Keogh, who said that when playing um, Grand Theft Auto 4, um, the, the game felt heavy to play. And so this was created by like the way that the, um, the player's avatar moved through the space, the sound design, the visual design, all these elements were designed to increase the level of immersion that a player um, feels when playing the video game. Just stopping for some water. <coughs> so we can view the experience of immersion or the um, construct of immersion as this kind of exchange between the viewer and the, um, the representation. I'm just going to get my cards because I'm not remembering. Um, <laughs> So yeah, the experiential outcome of an exchange between the work and the viewer, which has been associated with different design strategies depending on the format. So Mads Danzo, uh, who was the founder of Macropole, which was an immersive media company uh, based in Europe. I'm not sure if they're around anymore, but they were doing amazing work. And he talked about the experience of immersion in fully immersive environments as the idea of floating, swimming, or diving. Um, so when it comes to diving, researcher, prominent VR researcher Mel Slater um, said that um, basically uh, full immersion or deeper uh, immersion comes about through the sensory affordances of the platform. Mm. Just check that I've said everything I want. Yeah, so you feel a compelling sense of being there in a virtual world through its complex sensory affordances. So this brings us all the way back to the present, the age of spatial computing. Um, and so this is really like the pinnacle of the merger between the human body and uh, the technology where we can traverse both um, simulated environments and real environments at the same time. So who finds this exciting? Who finds this a little bit scary? <laughs> yeah, I'm both too. Depends and on like how many times I'm kicking the table. <laughs> <laughs> how many times I'm running into the, you know, the um, bookshelf. Yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. It definitely depends. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Um, and I'm going to address some of the negative aspects um, to this at the end. But first, I'm going to shift gears and we're going to look at the phenomenon of immersion that's been kind of tracking alongside, sorry, emotion that's been tracking alongside immersion. They're kind of similar, actually. <laughs> um, easy to get confused. So, emotion. To feel is not a uniquely human attribute, but to feel so intensely certainly seems to be the case. So, what is emotion? Um, it's a social construct. It's a way to categorize the range of feelings humans can experience. So in a recent study, um, researchers observed up to 27 different emotions um, in participants who were exposed to emotionally evocative videos. But a lot of researchers agree that there are four, about four key emotions, which are fear, sadness, anger, and joy. Um, so, in entertainment, emotion is a way to understand and market different storytelling genres. Um, and as I looked at in my PhD, and the medium through which an experience is delivered can dramatically alter the nature of our emotional engagement with it. So, this brings me to the framework. Um, so basically with my PhD, and I'm going to explain all this, so don't worry, it's probably, guys at the back probably can't read that. Um, uh, but basically um, what I was looking at with my research was 
understanding what differentiated engagement and the emotional experience of um, immersive technologies versus say playing a video game or um, watching Netflix. It was not about is this better, it was definitely just more about how is it different. So basically when I looked, I looked at a bunch of um, immersive works, mostly in VR at the time, um, and I also did like interviews with um, content creators um, and like, you know, research of news reports and reviews of work and that kind of thing. And what I identified, and there's kind of, you know, everyone has like a different take on this, but what I identified was there was what I called three different complex emotional states um, that were specific to emo immersive environments. So the first one is the expanded self. So basically the user through their interactions with a responsive environment or a, um, a, char a virtual character or being has this sense that their self has shifted in, in, in a way. Um, and then the embodied archetype is more of that full, a fuller kind of perspective taking where there's more of a um, identification with that character. Um, so it's kind of like a progression from the expanded self. And then the climactic is essentially the response to, um, you know, the intensity of being in a surround, uh, fully immersive surrounding. Um, and the, the experience that you have there is awe. And so in order to get to these complex emotional states, you have to, what I proposed is that you have to reframe um, engagement or co-creation through the sensory possibilities. So there's many, but the seven top ones or most common ones that I identified were see, touch, move, taste, hear, smell, and breathe. And then you also had to introduce co-creational design techniques, uh, which are specific to the um, platform. So those were encounter, performative, and ludic. I see that a, a couple of letters have fallen off there, but it's basically encounter, performative, and ludic. So encounter is essentially just the idea that nothing can happen, there's no dramatic possibilities unless you have had an encounter with a responsive environment or a virtual character or being. The performative is essentially drawing on um, established techniques from dance and immersive theatre to create those dramatic possibilities and, and it's a lot about the way like bodies uh, move together in like a fluid um, emotive way and then ludic draws on basically a long established techniques from video games which is um, missions and micro missions in service of narrative structuring. Um, so. Obviously this is like more relevant to fully immersive environments, but it also can relate to Web3 or Metaverse gaming. The difference is you are projecting into the avatar. The avatar then experiences this world. And these are kind of like some of the possibilities that um, it can kind of experience. Um, and also if you take out and like really narrow down your sensory modes of engagement. So for example, you only had move. So I don't know if you guys have seen the the sphere in Las Vegas where it's like this new amazing kind of immersive entertainment venue and they have the screens around so if you think about it like the audience can now move and see this all of this stuff around them whereas if you're just looking at like a 2d screen there's none of that movement but you take out everything else um, and you just have the climactic so it's much more of a passive experience but it still has that kind of kinesthetic experience and obviously the immersive environment generates an emotional response. Um, so this is just an example of how the framework can be applied, just kind of looking at it um, from a real world case study. So Neil Gaiman is a popular uh, children's book author and fantasy author. He wrote um, The Wolves in the Walls. And then Fable Studio, who are ex-meta and uh, creative agency people, they did the Wolves in the Wall VR experience in 2018. So it was one of the works that I looked at really closely for my study. Um, and so basically Pete Billingham, who was the director on the project, said that when they started out, they said, okay, we're gonna take video games and film, um, we'll put it together and then we'll like have the interactive mechanic for this. And so they did that and they got 
you know, got a, along a bit of the way and then they hit a wall. And so basically they ended up working with Third Rail Productions because um, they, who are an immersive theatre company in New York, um, who could help them figure out the, dra the dra dramatic, how to create dramatic possibilities in this like simulated environment, which you can look at a lot like a stage, right? Um, and so basically the work drew a lot on dance and immersive film techniques in the way that Lucy kind of inhabited the space um, and how she responds to the user. So the user plays the imaginary friend of Lucy. Lucy is on a mission to uncover clues that there are wolves living in the walls of the house and so basically in the end the wolves do come out of the house and there's this wolf battle and the user has the opportunity to um, like embody become like this sort of archetype character by um, helping to recover her beloved pig puppet that's gotten lost in the whole mission um, which I find very, very exciting to do something like that. Other people might be like, that's very silly. Um, but anyway, so it just shows how, um, you, you know, all of the interaction had to be reframed through these co-creational techniques. And the sensory experience was really movement and touch, like feedback, haptic feedback through the handheld controllers. So that was basically how it kind of applied to the entertainment space. And then once I had done that part of my research, I said, okay, how do these findings apply as we look at other emerging use cases of immer immersive technologies? Um, and so if you see actually a lot of different applications, um, such as how we heal, play, work and learn, we can see that they will evolve through immersive technologies, which will create engagement via emotional experiences that are channeled through our bodies. So obviously, every emotional experience is channeled through our bodies. We actually feel things before we like said, oh, that was funny and laughed. Like, but this is like on a, a deeper, um, more intense embodied experience. So in the healthcare space, um, VR can offer the chance to be someone or somewhere else um, for a few minutes or an hour. Um, a multiplayer location based game which is obviously entertainment can turn into an icebreaker experience because you have this like intimate collaborative experience with strangers and then that actually makes you not strangers anymore um, this uh, hyper real avatar did anyone say this it was with Lex Friedman um, in conversation with um, Mark Zuckerberg because they're like buddies um, they these these are their avatars and like Mark Zuckerberg's responses to anything like related to VR are so classic. He was like, oh my God, you look so real. It's like, you're really here. Like he's really like, he means it. He's, you know, honestly astounded. So, you know, the, the applications for, um, you know, uh, social VR or um, in work context where, you know, like you want like brainstorming, right? Um, and then also in education, the applications for learning through or. So I think all of this means that um, we're definitely going to see immersive technologies impact um, like, and create new types of emotional experiences that can have a profound impact on how we live. Um, so I just actually wanted to share a story with you guys. Um, so Professor Michael Balfour, who is the head of um, the School of Arts and Media, which is where I did my PhD. He's been working on this incredible project called Future Stories. Uh, and so basically what they're doing is going into hospitals and doing these co-design projects with children with chronic illnesses in long hospital stays. Um, and so the pilot study that they did, they created a moon landing for one boy. Um, another one was a BMX bike park experience. Um, another woman, another girl was going back to like where she grew up and experiencing her home village. Um, and so these were like these amazing kind of projects that had real meaning to these, these kids. But one of the participants, when they approached him to say, would you like to take part in this study? He said, well, yeah, of course, what the hell else have I got to do? Like, you know, for them, a few minutes or a few, a few hours, um, having this experience is, changes their day, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, it shows you that, yeah, there are amazing applications. Okay, so that brings us to future of digital design and three trends that I think 
um, are significant. So the first one is, um, I'm sure you guys have all seen uh, over the last year with AI becoming mainstream um, and impacting all of our lives and work, there's been kind of a bit of a narrative around like human creativity versus AI. Um, and it kind of reminds me of, you know, stairs versus elevators and like when elevators were invented, everyone said, oh my God, no one's going to use stairs anymore. Um, but of course we just, you know, still use stairs, but elevators in some situations are better. Um, so, you know, hopefully it'll be a bit like that, but I think we do run the risk of this is probably just a personal opinion. Um, I worry that, you know, our digital experiences could like just become populated by AI spam. Um, and worse, I think, is that we could potentially lose um, human craftsmanship, which is a way that we get a lot of meaning um, in our lives. So um, I think that, you know, people who are already masters of a craft who actually master AI ha will be able to play a really important role in shaping our relationship with AI. Um, and I just want to give this one example. Um, so it's this short film called In Search of Time. Um, the director, Pierre Zandrowicz, I met a few years ago at the Future of Storytelling Festival. He's done amazing work, mostly in like XR entertainment. Um, they were like some of the original guys that were like, this is the future, everything's gonna go into this and they just kind of like went for it. Um, but last year he did an AI project and um, it's on nowness.com and you can just search um, in search of time. We don't have time to watch the, the film right now, but it's about six minutes. But essentially what they did, him and um, Matthew Tierney was his collaborator. So it was a film about the relationship between a, a father and son and about time and memory. and. Um, they shot it all on an iPhone with real people or, ca or actors and then they used stable diffusion to overlay on top of the film um, the way to make the characters and like the environments animated. And what's incredible about it is it really creates this intimacy um, and emotion um, through the fact that you can really like identify with, with the character, this AI generated characters in a way that you wouldn't otherwise. Um, and for me, this was just an amazing, like really inspiring example of using AI as a tool to augment human creativity, but the human creativity is absolutely still there. Um, and, you know, it's done something innovative um, with use of it. Um, the next trend, uh, which we've already gone into quite a lot of detail on this, but obviously um, with the age of spatial computing, we're going to require new skills in spatial interface design and an understanding of how this shift to experiment, experiential media will influence our lives. Um, so I think there's been a lot of focus on the technology itself, like the headsets, um, but I actually envision that at some point people will also start to think about um, in the interior design, because if you think about it, all of our, t like our interior design is all around our um, relationship with two-dimensional technology and this is all about like sort of breaking us free from that so if you look at like um, immersive technology is kind of like a plane ticket and where do you go when you have a plane ticket you go to the airport and airports are these amazing liminal spaces which get you ready to transport you somewhere else so I actually think we're going to need and we will eventually start to see the redesign of physical spaces to actually complement these spatial um, environments. Um, so for example, hospitals, immersion rooms where patients go to enhance their experience or to, you know, for therapy, healing, um, and obviously schools, like um, universities, that kind of thing, where immersion labs where they go to create, but also where they can go to like travel the world and learn without actually having to go anywhere. Um, so I think it'll be really about this relationship between the digital interfaces but also our physical environment. And then the last one um, is really about convergence and so I hope we start to see um, solving of complex real-world problems and enhancing <coughs> our lives through convergence. 
Um, so one area that I'm really excited and interested about is XR and AI. Um, so for example, thinking about like medical students with training uh, where they go into a simulated environment and there's an uh, AI agent who basically walks them through, they do some sort of scenario planning which helps them, you know, better plan for like patient experience, that kind of thing. Um, another project which just got my attention and interest, um, so the guys who did and girls who did uh, the Fable Studio who I talked about before, so they've actually moved away from um, narrative stuff and they are working on this project called The Simulation and basically the idea is to train AI agents in a game which is like human life and the idea is for these agents to build memories similar to the way we have memories and also enhance their language capabilities so that they one day populate future metaverses. Um, and so obviously the applications in entertainment, you know, you can gaming, you can think about that, but also makes me think of like AI assistants that become like, yeah, personal collaborators, even like in a work sense, you know, they facilitate meetings for us or oversee meetings. Um, so really there's just so many possibilities um, that, you know, could eventuate from convergence. We're almost to the end. Um, okay, just ethics and design. So with all these new possibilities, there are obviously many potential trade-offs and risks. So we've already seen with digital media addiction, TV streaming addiction, um, that negative outcomes come hand in hand with design features which keep users immersed and engaged. So I'm not a techno optimist. I am kind of toying around with this idea more of like techno agency, um, which is that I think we should, you know, enjoy what digital media has to offer, aim to uncover its most pressing um, applications and use cases, but we need to find methods that put us in control. Um, of the technology, not the other way around. Um, and so that might sound really obvious, but like so easy to think about, you know, recently being on your mobile phone, like scrolling and then realizing you've been there for half an hour, you're in this weird position, you're like uncomfortable and you didn't want to be there, like that's not in control, right? So it's kind of easier said than done. Um, but in the case of, um, what am I talking? Uh, yes, so in the case of immersive environments, some of the risks are the intensity of being in a simulated world and also the possibility of getting lost. For example, you know, I saw, I don't know if any of you guys saw the video of the guy with the Apple Vision Pro headset walking across the, um, the crossing and then he just doesn't quite get to the, uh, off the road and just is like interacting with his like the, the interface before he even gets off the road and so it's like he's 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 not he's not aware of the risk of his behavior right and like people are saying you know you can't be wearing your apple vision pro and like just walking down the street because you'll you'll forget you might be have a propensity to like not know what's going on around you um, and then obviously like the, with the whole idea of getting lost there's also like you don't know like who somebody you know another avatar might be masquerading as, as somebody else so um, those are some of the the risks there um, So um, when I was doing my research, I came across uh, Christina Hook was this researcher who applied um, soma aesthetics in interaction design. So the idea is like obviously, you know, as users we need to be in control, as designers we need to find methodologies that help us kind of understand and uncover the risks. Um, and so if you apply her approach, so basically soma aesthetics is uh, the idea of chewing into ch tuning into our um, intuitive embodied um, sort of reactions as a way to approach work or, or the arts and so she applied it to interaction design um, and so she basically talked about how we need to tap into our soma slow down feel the interaction and reveal through that we reveal the unique nuances of, of the technology that we're working with and what I found kind of applying that was that through that we can then understand the risks better so an example of this was 
Mike Connolly, who was like one of the early VR evangelists, and he was working on um, some amazing work translating one of his uh, books, which was like a gothic noir <coughs> book, into this fully immersive environment. So it was like these <coughs> Italian um, abbey, decrepit Italian abbey, um, ancient abbey, and you went below into the catac uh, catacombs. And um, basically at one point, this hideous creature of Caliban comes out at you at the shadows. And so he, he just played it out like it would be in a film. And then when he went into the environment, he was like, oh my God, like that was so intense. Uh, you know, that was created this like lizard brain reaction and created a jump scare, you know, for him. And so he said like, this is not what I'm trying to do. Like I want to just toy with the edges of discomfort, but it was really about having it be an interactive narrative experience. So by kind of going into the technology, tuning into how it felt, he was able to then adjust it um, to uh, avoid a, what could have been a negative experience for some users. And that brings me to the end of the presentation. So thank you very much. contact details and yeah if anyone tries to find the video on nowness and can't just shoot me a message on LinkedIn and I'll just send you the link. Awesome. Thanks Kate. That was Thanks great. That. Yeah. Any questions for Kate? You can ask her directly, I won't mediate them. <laughs> yes. So Sorry, you, you I'm not too many. I probably shouldn't. But I was so curious because like you, you know like particularly like with that even just with that last one like do you think there's an opportunity opportunity is not the right word but, you know, okay, opportunity for like causing trauma when it comes to games, and is there opportunity as well then to also maybe treat it and like PTSD, PTSD treatments mm. with those emerging yeah. technologies? Yeah, yeah, so both. Um, in terms of causing trauma, actually, it was really interesting. I was at a conference a couple of years ago, and we got to talking about the fact that different cultures actually relate to violent content in different ways in the same way that like different cultures might have different relationships to death you know and so it's it's kind of hard to to navigate that right because everyone has like a different threshold in what's appropriate um, because there was this one uh, experience that was like exposing people to what it was like being in like a war torn in environment and actually like to be you know, near bombings and that kind of thing. And some people were just like, I can't, like, I could never do that. So, yeah, it's it's an issue. And, um, you know, I think, yeah, like, I think communicating to people so they have expectations ahead of, like, what they're going into because it is so intense. And, like, if people are just having an immersive experience for the first time, like, they're, they're not necessarily going to know <coughs> what that's like. Um, and definitely, like, we've become attuned to violence on television, but it's completely different when you go into a fully immersive environment. And then for PTSD, yeah, there's um, already, they're already doing that kind of, those kind of applications, um, definitely, already. So, yes. Okay, that's yeah. Cool. I'll, I'll let someone else have a go. Yes. Hi. Um, just, um, I was just looking at the, uh, the child and the learning through or picture. Mm. And I was thinking about... Um, People wearing headsets, and you know, you might use amongst other avatars, but is there a way to immerse without the headset and have a shared experience of immersion? That's kind of what I was thinking about. Yeah, I mean, I a think about that, beyond. like holograms. That's yeah. what I think about, like you know, what they show in sci-fi films. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, What's that? Yeah, exactly. Like, no, it's it's not you're not confined yeah. by the the headset, right? <laughs> like you're actually just interacting with digital screens and yeah i mean that technology doesn't really exist yet I think but so for me it's yeah. the perception of having a shared experience versus having an individual experience with a headset that i'm concerned about for children learning for yeah example. yeah well so with children um, it's quite interesting because I'm a member of the Responsible Metaverse Alliance mm. and um, they were talking about using virtual reality headsets with kids and they actually found that um, kids under year five got headaches mm. when they were using it mm. and actually Meta used to have age 12 as their minimum and they yeah. reduced it to 10. And like I think this is a massive area that yeah. needs way more research yeah. um, because I you know obviously kids are going to be like they they were saying they were using 
virtual technology and the kids were so interested and like excited about it and that's all great but yeah we need to kind of understand because their brains are still growing yes. you know so yeah I think it's there needs to be a lot more research yeah, around that yeah yes uh, more um, probably less of a question but more about your research mm. um, so you mentioned before about the sphere um, mm. Did you get a chance, or have you spoken to anybody that actually attended, say, like a YouTube concert, or anything, just to get some, get some, <laughs> get some I, feedback, you know, on, on the... I want to go. Who wants to go? <laughs> I mean, it looks amazing. No, I haven't yeah. spoken to anyone that's been there, um, but it just looks phenomenal, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, the so other thing I, I was going to say just on that is that um, there was a lot of criticism, and, and rightly so, with... Um, you know, the sort of like technology that was being used around the time of Avatar and like 3D TV as well as another problem as well. Which TV? Uh, 3D TV. So 3D. Samsung, oh, yeah, 3D. Yeah, Samsung yeah, yeah, yeah. were trying yeah. to introduce 3D yeah. TV. Yeah. Yeah. And the biggest issue they had was, you know, epilepsy and things like that. Mm. Um, but also, just as a matter of fact, I do know some people that have worked, you know, in that area. Yeah. You know, yeah, as a production house, and it did affect some of their designers who have been mm. working on, say, like you know, a project for six months, right? And yeah. constantly looking at that technology. You yeah. Know? So it's like becoming a bit of a health issue there. So mm. I just wondered if that come up in your your well, you know research. Just or? personally, I mean, because I basically was in this lab, which was a shoebox size no. room with a couple of headsets because you know it was early days there wasn't much investment um and yeah i would i would easily you know kind of get lost in there and find that i'd been in there for half an hour but i very easily tired you know and um yeah like my eyes would get sore yeah there was definitely impact um so hopefully that's getting better with the resolution um but but, but yeah long but i don't yeah they in terms of usage, that's a whole other area. Yeah. 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 But I mean, I, I yeah. can see what you're presenting tonight. The real positives with, you know, you talked about health and, and mm. like, you know, when somebody's recuperating that sort of thing. Yeah. You know, trying to speed up the recovery process. Mm. I think that's some, you know, amazing. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. No, thanks for those comments. Great. Have you mentioned the shared experience thing? Was that you, Sarah? Yeah. So there's a very funny show called Uploaded. Yeah. The wife the wife that was in the in the bathtub. Yeah, in the bathtub with like the wet suit. Yeah, that was that was pretty So weird. Um any other questions? Yes. Um when you mentioned about the um meta headset, like I remember when like I think it was last year, like Mark Zuckerberg and like it got me thinking now when I look at like your presentation talking about like the immersive environment and like the benefits like color of it, I found it really interesting. But I do wonder like what would the workplace look like now that we had COVID for remote work and remote work's more common and also like hybrid work, how do you think VR headsets could be immersed in this sort of environment mm. if the health issues are resolved by them in like the next ten years? Yeah. Is that curiosity? No, I know when the COVID thing was happening, like a, the people that I knew kind of went into like renting out headsets to people that wanted to like have that collaboration and, and didn't get that anymore. And I know that the um, hygiene like was a massive issue of like putting something in your face, you know, that somebody else has had and they had this whole like process with ultraviolet light and stuff. Um, so I guess I think that was an issue then, but I feel like people are, I don't know, I think we're getting used to like we're all here today, right? Um, so yes, there's there's ways of, of managing that I think, um, and who knows maybe people have their own devices and take them to to work, um, you know, so they don't have to share. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely think eventually work places will be redesigned around more usage of uh, you know spatial interfaces rather than like two D computers and desks. Yeah. Um, sorry, you have. Yeah, a no, I was just wondering about um, uh, uh, neurotech. So, mm -hmm. have you done any explorations on um, the brain-computer interface with mixed reality? 
No. <coughs> have you looked at that? Um, yeah, a little bit. Okay. So we've been oh, playing be with a few ideas. <coughs> oh, well, I'd be really interested And also, really just to touching on the that. biggest topic of holographic realities. <laughs> yeah. Is, there's actually a company called Axiom Holographics okay. in Brisbane that I've yeah. been working closely with. So there's oh, a lot of interactive ideas there which are oh, sort of more shared experiences and yeah. things like that. So with the hologram technology, how far off do you think that would be from like a so we've been working on hologram available. tables, walls, right. spaces, tunnels. Right. You know, it's a little bit passive because it's more right. for like we had a hologram zoo, okay. which was set up in the Australian Museum. If anybody saw that, so, okay. and then yeah. we've got it in Brisbane right now. But um, it's the interactive one is more on the table. It's like a yeah. you know, just as like the size of this, this uh, television, just flattened out. But you've got like smart so cities and digital yeah. twins that we've been exploring on, on that space. So oh, cool. I'll, let's chat later. I want to hear yeah. what it is so I can look no, it up. Yeah. Oh, that's but good. I think the other topic I wanted to just, I think I already touched on it, was neuroplasticity. Uh -huh. So, you know, do you think that's going to be a big, um, well, is there much research done on the current sort of models there? That's not something that I've looked at so much. Um, but yeah, I mean, definitely, I think, you mean in the way that the brain's going to change? Exactly, with, yeah, yeah. It, yeah. I mean, especially the children topic, for example. Yeah, you know? yeah. You've seen a lot of uh, influence there. Yeah. Yeah. That. yeah, yeah. No, that's a whole other dimension. <coughs> yeah, the psychological as well dimension yeah. to yeah. it. Yeah, exactly. definitely. Yeah. Mm, very interesting. Sorry, yes. I think I'm, like, I wasn't sort of the monetizing as well. It's, you know, how they, I guess, monetize these products yeah. and how then that creates what the ideal um, what it looked like to work a company. I mean, Facebook now is what the old newspapers were just yeah. ads and selling out and out and out. Other. And I suppose, you know, aside from selling a piece of hardware, then the rest of it's monetized through the minority points, bringing up pop ups around how much this costs. Do you think, is there a much area where it, it could become more of just a, a, a large marketplace of ads and, and so forth? Or is it, <coughs> I mean, in other words, yeah, like how they'll integrate yeah. advertising into the experience. Um, yeah, it's a good question. I wonder, how do they do that with the Metaverse game? So, I mean, I think a good example would be skins. So, like, if you think about, like, how consumers are changing, like, the way that they want to interact with brands. So, um, you know, you hear a lot of... Um, parents talking about how like my cousin was talking about his kids who are te young teenagers and he's like yeah they just want to spend all their money on skins and like all they do is spend time <laughs> in their metaverse yeah. games they don't even care how they look in real life and I, I was like oh come on really and he's it's actually true so um yeah that's kind of an example right where it's like what the kids are wearing in I a game heard of it, like in a high school because another kid had used coffee the same Skin in the game. Okay. Yeah, amazing. Two girls were riding in the game. One of the coffee games. Wow. And, and that's where the other most experience sessions in Roblox. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, to be fair, it does blow my mind that I've seen, like, at my friend's place, her girls playing games about cleaning and cooking, but they won't do that. Like, they could do their own room. Right. <laughs> like, they're just there. <laughs> Yes. How do we how do we get this <laughs> like, from gaming into the real world? Yeah. <laughs> Look, <laughs> close away. Yeah. yeah. Most guys right Sorry. Yes. Just yeah, but you don't want to shoot this in the room. room. Hang on. Sorry, guys. Do you mind just keeping it out? Nope, yes. Sorry. Just touching on the ads side of things. Like yeah. nothing's free in the world. So mm -hmm. if it's a way of them getting money, essentially, mm -hmm. they will put ads on there. So if you're not putting money into the device or yeah. into their systems, they have to get their funds from somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, make them through investors, but they will actually look for in turnovers. Have a look at what Facebook has done. So uh, yeah, that's true. I know, like, yeah. Yeah. Sure. I mean, I know, like the data thing acquisition. is really concerning. Yeah. What they can have access to when you're in a fully immersive environment and, you know, uh, all of the sensory dimensions to that. So that's what they'll be selling. And also, so no one really wants to be paying ten thousand dollars for one of these devices. So yeah, selling data is or actually yeah, themselves. yeah, mm -hmm. selling data is actually an option. Servers are not cheap to run. Mm. So yeah. that like raises yeah, like a very good point. Mm -hmm. like the whole thing like where does like things like fraud come into all of this and how like how does it 
You mean like who knows? Yeah. yeah. Like identity theft and stuff yeah. like that. Mm. Yes, that's a big concern yes. for um, law enforcement. Yeah. With, with well, it's that deep yeah. fake, Kate, and I was talking about it earlier, it was that deep mm -hmm. fake thing, um, and they, were, they convinced a banker to move like thirty million dollars across out of account, and they he was talking to two people who thought were his bosses. Yeah, I don't know how this helps with him. But it's like I don't know. No, no, no it's going to be there? it's going to be a massive issue. I mean, that's the reality. Yeah, it's, it's going to be yeah, but they're going to have to like they 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 were talking about. So I was on one of these metaverse meetup um, alliance things, and um, people who are working on this were talking about actually using AI to to detect some of this stuff. So hopefully they'll be able to come up with sophisticated innovations to target all of these things. Because what they were saying is the all of the criminal networks are basically like they're ahead of law enforcement. So they 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 go to new technologies and they're like this is an opportunity and it's the same groups moving from so they'll move from you know two D to three D and they're very creative and innovative. Well they're agile. Yes. Uh, so we see we should be looking for inspiration from organized crime. Yes. yes, yes. Well, they're more creative. This is the thing that law, the, the police that were on the phone were like, yeah, like we need to be creative. We're not creative. This is our problem. Like we need to be like the criminals and be creative with how we do. Yeah. More money in crime. Yeah. That's why porn sites were the first. Yes, they are very innovative too with their. In the military. Yeah, 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 in the in the military. Yeah, 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 in the military. Or something that might be on the cusp of being mainstream. Yeah. So your research on this space, do you understand how people interact with this, how they create new emotional experiences? I know that the cat's sort of out of the bag. We don't know where this is going. Um, will it catch on? Will it fall off? But in your opinion, having worked with people who work with this technology, do you think it is a net Positive or net negative? Should this technology be Yeah. I mean, I just think you just need to look historically, and um, we. I, I mean, I just think it's used for positive and negative. That that's you know that's what we've seen with technology. Um, but yeah, I just think that we all need to work really hard to to emphasize the positives, right? Um, where we can um, and be ethical in, in our approach to working with new technology. So like even though I'm, you know, my research was in the design space, I joined this Metaverse Alliance, even though I'm not like in the law enforcement, you know, or um, any of those, I just thought, well, if, you know, I'm going to be involved in design in some respect, um, then I want to just have these, these what these guys are worried about, I want to have that like front and center in my thinking. Um, so I just think everyone needs to make it their business. Mm. Yeah. I reckon that's the perfect note to... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes, thank you. <laughs> that, and that's, thank you. And I think it is a perfect note to finish on because I was going to ask, and it was a great question, thank you. Of you, I think you said you're not a techno uh, optimist. Mm, yeah. And I think you probably covered that perfectly. So it's it's not predetermined. It's people like us mm. who actually get to determine how this goes, how it plays out, how much towards the positive, yeah. optimistic end of the spectrum, how much towards the pessimistic end of the spectrum. It's not predetermined. It's a tool, and we get to guide it. So it's the way you talk well about said. the ethics and being mindful and good. You know, designing with empathy, that's up to all of us. Mm. We get to do that. It's but not, okay. this is the version, you're stuck with it. We get to do this together. Yeah. So exactly. please thank Kate again. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. thank and 
Who has, who's first said DT is it? How many people this is their first time? Yay! Yay! First of all, welcome. That was a surprisingly small number of hands. It's uh, probably the lowest number of first timers I think we've ever had. And this is a bunch who aren't fessing up. But what you might not know is that Sid DT for tonight has only just started. We now continue at the pub. So <laughs> we're, going, we're going around the corner to Strawberry Hills. Uh, it's, a rat. It's, it's, on the rat. Rat. it's on the outside, I, I hope. You, you hungry? Yeah, I'm gonna kill it. It's on the outside. It's on the outside, you're not gonna catch it. Eleanor! Eleanor! You have to get dinner later. So <laughs> we're going to Strawberry Hills Hotel. It's only around the corner, it's open late. Uh, so that's where we're playing on. Come and join us next week. It is literally next week, same place, same time. I'm going to stuff it. And thanks for coming to the first CDT of 2024. Yay! See you next week. That's awesome. I was just wanting to make sure it was on the outside, that was all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I wasn't scared, it was more just like, I mean, the last time I saw a rat was like I'm hungry. New York.